I get to be the host for Pitch Stage. And has anybody seen Pitch Stage before? Here's the deal, we are gonna get three startups out here and our goal is to save everybody's time. Just get them going quick and, and let me, uh, let's see if I've got some slides here. That is a presenter. It is, it is a lonely, sad job being a presenter, especially if you're talking about tech, because here's what it feels like. And you're just talking to some guy, and it's bad news for everybody because you're, the presenter's not happy, and the person on the phone is just wishing they could use their phone in peace. So it's an enormous amount of waste. And so here's what we're gonna do to save everybody lots of times. We're gonna put a big screen, we're gonna get these folks out here to present, and here's the catch. Five minute timer. So any one of you who would have accepted a meeting with these guys, just by being here watching the five minutes, you may well have saved 55 minutes. And think how much time they'll have saved because they would have had to drive to visit all of you. Thousand people here, you save a thousand hours, they save a thousand hours, that's a man year. So we're gonna save three man years here. And the questions we ask them to address, simple questions, basically, why would you consider buying their product? What problem do they solve? Who are they? Why are they special? Get off the stage. Um, actually, we want to make it a little bit more interesting than that. We thought we couldn't figure out how to get mics to a thousand people, so we said, let's choose a couple of customers. These are, these are people that we know, but they've been coming to Evolve, and we'll get them on stage, and we'll get them asking the, the questions that you might have asked, hopefully, and maybe I get to ask a question, and, and we'll just work through this whole thing. There's three of them. I think of this as being a lot like speed dating, but these are companies that are not competitors. So the key difference between this and speed dating is you are allowed to go home with all three <laughs> in your data center. At the, at the very end, we're gonna have an opportunity, not as part of the presentation, but for people to do a vote. And uh, is there one of them that you'd like to spend more time with? And we'll do a WebEx to, to get more. So that'll be something you can do at the, the very end of this. You get to pull out. The previous one looking at their phone, that was bad. Don't do that. This one is voting after. That's good. So, uh, oh, oh, I messed up. Um, I have these two seats here. The two customers, I was going to call them out. Could I get the two customers to come on out? So these are actual live IT people <laughs> with budgets. <laughs> Would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, uh, I'm Erez Nier. I'm CTO at uh, Mitchell International. I'm Dino Starnary. I'm the Group Vice President of Advanced Engineering and Integration for Charter Communications. <laughs> they, they are your proxies. So here, here's how it's gonna work. Um, I'm gonna bring the first customer out, and he, Joe, is going to present. He's gonna have exactly five minutes. I'm gonna sit down, his timer will start, and when he comes, I'll give him the clicker, and when five minutes goes off, I'm gonna stand up in the middle of whatever he thinks he's doing. <laughs> I have an observation. Have you ever seen a presentation where the customer didn't start interrupting within the first five minutes? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend the next five or more just doing Q&A with these two. I'm allowed to ask a question if I want to, but I am not a CIO, and so, uh, so my questions might be less relevant. Anyway, let's welcome Joe. <laughs> welcome. Ready? Uh, this is on your time. Well, all right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. My name is actually Peyton Manning, and I'm going to oh. talk to you about cloud security. Oh, wait. There's a couple of subtle differences. I'm a little bit shorter, less athletic, about the height of a hobbit. But other than that, you won't even notice it. So let's jump right into it, and let's talk about cloud security. Your challenge, our solution, right? Your apps have moved to the cloud. Your data then got on a plane and followed your apps right into the cloud. After that, your users adopted devices that you can't secure, and you don't even know where they are or what they are. 
So this has led to the creation of an entire industry. That industry is Cloud Access Security Broker, or CASB. Gartner created that term. Now, they've had one magic quadrant, and BitGlass is the only visionary in that magic quadrant. So what makes BitGlass different? Well, the first thing is we're software only. You can't buy hardware, we're deployed in the cloud, and another huge difference is we are in line to all of your cloud applications. So all of your data going up and down into the cloud is secured by us real time in line. Let's make this real, Office 365, the number one cloud application on the planet, right? How about Box? How about if you're accessing it from a tablet as opposed to your PC? Well, what about Google Docs? Yep, we do that too. Salesforce, we have patented searchable encryption for Salesforce. Box, right? Maybe you wanna access that from your mobile phone. All of these applications and any cloud application can be secured by BitGlass. Let's make this even more real. Office 365, right? Most widely deployed application on the planet. What does it look like to log into MicrosoftOnline.com? Well, you type in your email address, right? Takes you to your organization sign-in page. Then what happens depends on your authentication. We don't care what it is. Ping, Okta, Duo, none of that matters to us. We support it all. And then if you authenticate success successfully, you see your native experience. You didn't notice it, but if you look at the URL closely, BitGlass is now in line inspecting traffic real time and we can take any action we want on that traffic. So let's talk about your data that followed your apps into the cloud, because they've left the building just like Elvis did. What does it look like when someone downloads a file? Have you ever wondered where that file went? What if I could tell you where the file went and every person that opened it for the rest of history with that file? What if I could then show that to you visually on a map and you could drill down to street level and see what's happening. Then the next question is, I want to revoke access. Well, we can do that too with the digital rights management container. On the fly, you download something, we'll make you authenticate just to view that file. And then if you're successful, you see this, you see the file. And if you're not, you don't get access. So think about that when you terminate employees or you have rogue employees that are taking data that they shouldn't be. Last example, let's talk about security for mobile. You ever dealt with a hospital? Doctors are not employees, they're contractors. They're not gonna let you put an agent on, on your device. What if you're trying to stop confidential information from going up and down to mobile devices, right? Well, we, we have our own active sync proxy that we can control all traffic to mobiles, no agent at all. We simply specify the email domains we can inspect for malware using Silence technology. Silence cannot do this on their own. They rely on BitGlass to provide security to mobile devices. We can block data, block content, and we can mask data, as you see here, or encrypt it. So social security numbers, PII information, all of that, we can block it, no problem, real time, because we're in line. And if you have a rogue employee who maybe you need to take action on, we can do a selective wipe. I can wipe out the email, the calendar, the contacts, and the to-do list associated with just the work account of that user and do a selective wipe of that phone. No one else does that. So, wrapping up here, where are we? We're everywhere AWS is. We're hosted in the cloud globally. If you need to talk to our customers, they're extremely vocal. We have hundreds of thousands of users deployed using BitGlass in line, real time, to secure their data and their applications in the cloud. They're happy to talk to you. And if you need resources and support, we have everything you need. You can go to our website, go to our training center, and you have all the resources you need right there. Thank you very much for having me today. Nicely done. Now, I've never been in a customer meeting where five minutes in, the audience started applauding. I'm just saying. <laughs> Can I have that clicker back? I'm yeah. gonna need that. So, so what do you guys think? Do you have any questions? So you, you mentioned agentless, you mentioned proxy. Deployments of these types of solutions are usually nightmares. How would yours be different? Yeah, so uh, generally our environment, especially for an agentless deployment, we, 
I'll talk to you, not him. So <laughs> our, our agentless deployment, I'll take mobiles as an example, right? Um, all we have to do is point people and it's auto discover at our active sync proxy. It gets pushed down. We can do it in production with no disruption. It is literally just an email server they're pointing at and we're, we can take control of that phone. Um, most people come to us because they have failed with an MDM deployment. And if you've ever been involved in an MDM deployment, you know how painful and intrusive that can be on your phone. So we can do that functionality with no agents. Talk to us more about how we do it. It's pretty fascinating. You know, I'm a, my background is tech. And so when I hear something that sounds so cool, it's magic, on the one hand, I love it. And on the other hand, I'm skeptical and I'm like, I don't see how that can work. I'm afraid they're lying to me. <laughs> and so this thing of like, I'm guessing Microsoft didn't let you add code to 365. Uh, and you're protecting 365, which you don't control, and a phone you don't control. And I was like, I had a chance to talk out. I was like, I don't even know how that's possible. I don't, and he goes, oh, here's how it works. At the login, we grab a hold of the stream, and we get the stream on this end, and we get the stream on that end, and we're a proxy in the middle, and my head's like, oh my God, that could work. That's, is that what you patented? <laughs> it does work, and we do have several patents, and uh, we're- I was like, anyway, I'm, I don't buy this stuff, but I admire it. Um, <laughs> Hopefully he will buy it, actually, so anyway. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, so my question is, it may be a little more technical, but uh, I think you're, it's awesome because you're solving a real problem for us too. Um, what happens to the documents once they get into the target device, mobile, laptop, whatever, if they try to leave that device? I mean, you're tracking them as long as you have reachability to them and you know where they are. Yep. But if somebody then sticks a, a USB and, down, and just copies them, you lost track of them. Is that, is uh, that so how, it, it, or are it, these documented, protected by your DRM? That's right. Or they cannot be exploited? So the simple answer is it depends if you're just doing simple callback functionality or watermarking, things like that. Uh, it works no matter whether it's on a USB drive, a laptop, or you're emailing it around. Uh, but if you actually want to take action and authenticate people that are opening up documents six months later after they've left the company, that's where you apply a DRM container or digital rights management so that no matter where that file is downloaded to and shared via G drive, USB, it doesn't, it doesn't actually matter. If you put a DRM container on it, which we do on the fly, in line, real time, you force someone to authenticate, therefore you can revoke those privileges at any time so three months, six months, a year later, someone tries to open intellectual property, they've stolen from your company, they will never be able to view it because it's in an encrypted container asking them to authenticate back to BitGlass. They won't be able to do it. That's interesting. So, and, and this container, how heavy is the container and would the target device, antivirus and other machines, yep. won't just target this as malware or? Yeah, so it won't be targeted as malware. It's actually very simple. The file gets downloaded. It's just wrapped in an HTML container file. So it's compatible with any device. And again, that happens on the fly. The user is completely unaware. The only thing the user, the user won't realize it until they try to open the file and then it will ask them for authentication. So you might download a PDF, but it's actually coming down in an HTML container file that uh, is asking for authentication and it's encrypted already. So you, are you seeing it as a, as a potential uh, replacement to what companies do today, deploying VDI farms just to allow remote, u remote users to use systems? Is that the uh, it, it, it certainly could be that. Um, the application is really any industry. What's interesting, I think, about BitGlass is our customers, no one industry dominates our customer base. Although healthcare is because of our DLP, DRM, and mobile support, healthcare really has a lot of problems that they need to solve. And because doctors, nurses, and everyone are not employees, you cannot control their devices. They won't let you put an agent on. But again, it, it's not specific to an industry. Our, our technology applies to any industry. Who do you find that you sell to? I mean, our typical customers, is it like the storage administrator because you're controlling files, or the mail administrator, or the CISO, or like who, who, who do you talk to? So the answer to that question is, we talked to a couple of different teams. We're definitely talking to the application team and we're definitely talking to the security team. Uh, we do not talk to the storage teams and here's why we do not store data. So anyone in, here, <laughs> anyone in here who is a HIPAA expert, you may know the difference between like data processors versus data handlers and HIPAA has all this uh, terminology they use. 
We're a data processor. We don't store your files. We protect them going up and down in the cloud, or we can scan them in the cloud, but it's very different from us being a storage company. And because we're hosted in AWS globally, uh, if you're looking for things like SOC 2 compliance and all of that, we already have that because the infrastructure we're hosted in has that as well. So you might start with a particular application that the customer cares more about, yeah. wh whatever. Like, oh, we're going to do email, so you start there. And then you'd be looking to say, you know, by the way, we could do other stuff too. Is that kind of how it starts? And maybe eventually you get to the CISO? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So most people do start with us because they have a couple of applications or they've discovered their users are sharing files on Box. Like intellectual property is sitting on Box or G Drive or somewhere, and they, they had no idea. So we started there and then they say, hey, we've got some homegrown applications that are in the cloud. Can you help us with that too? So the answer is we can support any cloud application. You've heard a lot of talk about AI here today. We've invested in machine learning, which is a more appropriate term for us because we watch applications, we figure out the leakage path. Mm -hmm. How is an application uploading and downloading data? but we don't hand code anything. Our machine learning algorithms watch it and learn it, and that way they automatically update our product to figure out how to protect any cloud application. I showed you the major ones, but it doesn't matter to us. We support any cloud application. So you're using machine learning. So we had the previous speaker saying all the hot, cool kids are doing machine learning, <laughs> and here it turns out. I didn't even hear that because I was backstage, and it's a different world back there. Any, any other questions from you two? Anybody want to shout anything from the audience? Oh yeah, try, let's see if this works. Shout. What is your business model? How do you make money? Okay, so the Ooh, question, I like that. I'm going to repeat the question so people can hear it. What is our business model? How do we make money? Great question. It's very simple. We charge per user, per application. Wait, you don't insert ads into their data? No. <laughs> that would be so cool. <laughs> we're, not, we're, not selling data. we're not selling your data. Again, we don't store data. Uh, but we charge per user, per app, per year. But again, that could be unlimited, it could be multi-year, but I hope that answers your question. It's a three second answer. Per app, per user, per year. Hey, that works surprisingly well. Any others? Bring it on, bring on the tough questions. I had five minutes up here. It's similar to date night with my wife. Anyway. Sorry, say again, please. To get started, like what's a typical deal? We're getting going, he's got a thousand people using email and you're gonna protect him for uh, the first month. So you are sitting, sir, you're sitting next to our VP of sales. After, <laughs> uh, in the front but I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question directly, but our VP of sales, Dean, is sitting right there. The answer is this, our deal sizes literally go from $1,000 to a multi-million dollar deal. It just depends on the number of users one reference customer was Orange County Public Schools in Florida. They just deployed over 200,000 users of our technology. We have people who deploy 10 users with our technology. We can be deployed in under 30 days for 200,000 users. So I'm gonna fish for one more question and I just wanna make an observation. So far in this room, we've got one guy who doesn't know what he's doing and all the rest of you who know what you're doing. <laughs> you know what that means, right? One more question. There we go. Ah, excellent question. You encrypted my files, I stopped using your service. Yep. Am I doomed? So the answer is no. You can, you can use keys provided by anyone you like, but you can also have a bring your own key model. Just keep in mind, and I, I have to up-level this because this is a deep conversation. When you encrypt data using a key, you can change the key later, but that data has been encrypted with the previous key. So you need to keep that key to, to decrypt your data, but we support a bring your own key model. You can use us, Amazon, your own key, doesn't matter. Great question. Hey, that was awesome. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Thank you both. Thank you. That wasn't so painful. We just saved our first man year. I was listening to Mark's talk at the beginning and he quoted Henry Ford. He said, I'm not sure if this is real, but Henry Ford said, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And he wondered if that was right. And I happen to know the answer. That is not right. What Henry Ford actually said is, if I'd asked my customers, they would have told me they wanted a faster horse that doesn't shit. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> 
I would like to bring on our next contestant. Come on out. Welcome, dude. Yeah. Thanks for having me on Shark Tank. I am the VP of strategy for a company called Dremio. That is not a unicorn dolphin, that's called a narwhal. Um, so they only gave me five minutes to talk. What are you gonna do in five minutes? So I thought, what are some different things? Well, you could listen to a song. You know, most songs are less than five minutes. Maybe some of you could solve a Rubik's Cube in less than five minutes. Anyone, Rubik's Cube less than five minutes? Oh, <laughs> somebody, actually, I didn't think anyone would say yes. Uh, 50 push-ups in under five minutes. Any hands for that? Yeah, it's a few more people that could do that. Uh, we could also meditate in about five minutes. We'd probably all be better off if we did a little bit more of that every day. And you could make a sandwich. And this got me thinking. Sandwiches, you know, they're delicious. A good sandwich is a really amazing experience that can be life-changing in some cases. And the more I thought about sandwiches, the more it made me realize that, you know, sandwiches are a lot like data in the enterprise. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, Data in the enterprise, this is Cat's Deli in New York if you've never been there. How is it like data in the enterprise? How are sandwiches like data in the enterprise? Well, if you were gonna go make a sandwich, you would start by going to get great ingredients at your favorite deli. And what's the experience like? You go, you take a number, and there's one guy that you're waiting on, you're on this side of the calendar, uh, of the counter, and that one person behind the counter is your data engineers. Because those of you on the other side are your data scientists, and they're your BI users who are waiting on the data engineer for the data that they need to do their jobs. Has anyone here waited on IT for data you need to do your job? It seems to be a core experience that everyone oh, come on, you're not paying suffers attention. through <laughs> on a daily basis. I know, I know I'm part of that. I would be, I raised my hand. So why does this happen? Um, well, we'll talk about that in just a moment, but let's think about the experience. So the BI users, the data scientists, they're all waiting, they're not doing their jobs, right? They're waiting and dependent on IT, and the experience of the data engineer is they're overwhelmed, right? They have a bunch of people in line that they can't service and, give and fulfill their needs as quickly and effectively as they'd like to. And the ratio of numbers we're talking about here in most companies is that for every data engineer, you have about 100 data consumers. So your BI users, your data scientists, your data analysts, there's about 100 of those for every one of your data engineers. And why is this such a challenge? Well, this is what your data engineer is doing. So you have data being created in different technologies. So your Oracle databases, your SAP systems, maybe some of you newer technologies like MongoDB and Elasticsearch or Hadoop, and that data is being moved by your data engineers into some kind of a data lake. Maybe that's in the cloud, maybe that's on-prem. Then that data gets moved into a data mart, then cubes and extracts and aggregation tables are built to fulfill these different needs of the different data consumers. So you have lots of copies, it's slow, it's complicated, it's fragile. What Dremio is all about is a completely different approach, where Dremio runs between the existing BI tools and data science platforms that you're already using, and all the different data sources you have, whether they're NoSQL, relational, your data lake, whether they're on the cloud or on-prem, Dremio runs right in the middle, and it gives a self-service experience for the data consumer to do everything they need on their own without being so dependent on IT, and it takes care of the really hard problems that your data engineers are struggling with today in terms of accelerating the data, uh, transforming the data for different purposes and different needs, and governing and securing for access for different user groups. So what is Dremio? It's a data engineering platform that helps you get more value from your data faster. It makes your data engineers more productive, and it makes your data consumers more self-sufficient. And let me just tell you about one customer, TransUnion. So TransUnion is a consumer credit reporting bureau that aggregates data on about a billion consumers worldwide. They have 65,000 customers in 30 countries. What do their data engineers do? Well, they process billions of updates a month from 90,000 sources on 30 petabytes of data. And they build innovative products like Prama that put that data in the hands of their customers. TransUnion uses Dremio to accelerate the analytics and visualization of that data for their customers, and they use Dremio to make their data engineers more productive so they can get more value from their data faster. So there are a few of us here, thank you, from, uh, from Dremio and the audience, uh, colleague Scott in the back, and we are actually pretty easy to recognize. You see us <laughs> walking around. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> does does do you my hear that in real customer meetings? I just have to know. Does my horn intimidate you? <laughs> Sometimes we do wear these to customer meetings. Yeah. So I have a question. I, I did a little bit of a research. Uh, what's what's the deployment model? Uh, I, I think you're you're saying that you guys are open source. Um, so what is the deployment model? What, what is an IT shop need to do in order to deploy your software? Yeah, so correct, Dremio is open source. It's a distributed system that you would run on, I mean, it's something you could try on your laptop, but it's something in production you would deploy on tens or hundreds or potentially thousands of nodes. Uh, if you have a significant investment in a Hadoop cluster, you can run Dremio as a native Yarn application in that Hadoop cluster, but it's not dependent on Hadoop. So, uh, one of our first customers is running Dremio on top of a mix of Elasticsearch and SQL Server, right? Um, with Tableau and Power BI as the tools of their, their data consumers. So the deployment model is you run it as a cluster. We have different types of nodes that scale out for data volumes and number of users. And it's an Elastic product that you can run in the cloud, on-prem, or wherever you like. So from the open source perspective, how do you want your customers to engage with you for the creation of connectors or adapters for systems that you don't currently support? Great question. So the truth is for every company that your data is in lots of different technologies because for 30 years the answer from every vendor has been just put your data in our silo and we'll solve all your problems. So you have a mix of relational databases, NoSQL, Hadoop, different kinds of things. We support the most popular data sources but there are things that we don't support today. And so we've, we've made Dremio open source so that everyone can use it, but also so that a community can build a different capabilities into the product, including connectivity to different sources. And we've already seen that with a tier one investment bank who's uh, in the process of open sourcing a connector to KDB, which is a, a specialized uh, uh, time series database that's been uh, available to financial services for a number of decades. So um, I, I steal from the audience. If you're open source, how do you make any money? Good question. Working on that? No. Uh, so we, our model is we have a community edition that has all the features and functionality uh, that most people need to fall in love with the product. And we have an enterprise edition that has some key capabilities around security and management capabilities and connectivity to a few high-end sources like Teradata and DB2. Um, so we sell a subscription, an annual subscription that we license per node that, uh, that allows us to monetize the product, and that subscription includes support and access to the enterprise edition of And Dremio. you structured it so that people can use it a little without the premium, but generally speaking, enterprise wear, would, would, people would want to get the subscription. We, are, we have startups that security is maybe not top priority for them, uh, where they're running Dremio on you know, 100 plus nodes on our community edition. Um, but most Fortune 1000 companies will view role-based access control and integration with LDAP and Kerberos and things like that as essential for a real deployment. So yes, you fall in love with the community edition, make it as big as you want, but when you want to go to into production, you're going to use the enterprise. Or edition. if you help startups grow up fast, then they That's hit right. a certain point and the board of directors starts asking certain questions. And right. Any more questions? Yeah, so w one other question I had uh, is, I, I know how long it takes for, to ramp up on a new tool. This is just as, as any, right? It's a new tool. What would you say, the time to, to become really proficient, because I, I saw how you drag in uh, different sources and you start you know, uh, dissecting the data, but you also need to know other sources and where the data is coming from. Yeah, so, so there's sort of two, two types of use of the product. One is the data consumer's use of the product, and that is something where we've looked at, some, we've looked at Google Docs, basically, and said, what is the experience of Google Docs? Did I take training on Google Docs? No, I, there's a search bar, I click, I can collaborate with other people, and I have native integrations to the most popular tools like Tableau and Power BI and Click, right? So with a single click of, of a button, you can launch that tool connected to a data set. You can write no code and do everything in a browser, and most people are off and running in the first few hours. Then you have the data engineer's experience with the product, which is a mix of RESTful APIs, uh, and foundationally, everything in Dremio is based on standard ANSI SQL. So to the extent you have people who know SQL, uh, they can use SQL to build and manage and perform their data engineering tasks, and then orchestrate that with the same kind of tools they're doing, they're using to orchestrate the rest of their infrastructure. And SQL is a really critical skill, right? And the beauty is that it's been around for 30 plus years, 
and every tool on the planet supports it, and that's why we made it the center of, of our technology and our uh, integration strategy. But there are a lot of newer technologies where your data is being created that don't support SQL. Things like S3, things like ADLS on Azure, things like MongoDB and Elasticsearch, and large pieces of Hadoop. They're really just not compatible with SQL. Well, with Dremio, everything is compatible with SQL. Everything is on a level SQL playing field, and we make it incredibly fast automatically in the background. And that's really the core value for a data engineering group is we can leverage our SQL skills and integrations and tools that are already deployed in the enterprise. It doesn't matter where we put our data, we get it really fast for all of our different analytical workloads. I'm kind of curious. Oh, did you have another question? Yeah, uh, no, go ahead. Don't. Well, I was just kind of curious. So here you are, high-level IT guy, and you run into someone like this, and he gives you his elevator pitch. Yeah. Like, where's the next stop in your organization? Do you send him straight to the data engineers, or like how, like, how would he navigate through when you go, oh, I know who you should talk to next? How did that work? Uh, we have a, da a data analyst data analytics team yep. as part of our network engineering organization that I would m tell you to go talk to immediately. Um, or talking larger into our operations organizations and understand there's a lot of disparate tools. We just went through a merger a couple years ago. We're still trying to bring the company together. So we're trying to bring all this stuff together. So there's a lot of sources of data. So talking to ops and, and talking to the analytics teams is who I would start with. Yeah, yeah th th that's my we'll experience bring, as well. Uh, I mean, we'll bring the analytics uh, team one of the leads, uh, you said SQL, so I'll bring a strong, uh, strong uh, SQL guy. I'll probably bring security just because mm -hmm. we're talking data, and I'll bring the infrastructure because I have to think about the cost. You're talking Where it's about gonna run. tens mm -hmm. and thousands of nodes. And say, Is that your experience typically? The last startup was security, so I figured it'd be the CISO, and he's like, no, it's the app owner whose app we're securing. And so I'm wondering if there's like another path in that you see sometimes. Well, there's, there's two paths for us. One is that core function in the company that's responsible for ETL and data warehouse and the Hadoop infrastructure and the BI servers and that kind of data services. So whoever's team, building the internal business intelligence. The central function that's powering all the different data consumer groups. Then we also meet the data consumer teams who say, you know what, I am tired of waiting. I want to do things myself. I don't want to stand in line in the data bread line holding my number waiting to be called. I want to go do these things myself, whether I'm a data sciences team working in Python and R or SAS or something like that, or the Tableau group that is tired of waiting on extracts to be built. And they want to go and build data sets themselves and get them in a really fast way using whatever tool they like. Got it. So, so we and, but in that model, it's sort of a, it's kind of like a pharmaceutical ad where it's like, ask your doctor about, because right. they're not going to buy Dremio right, 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 desktop. Right. But they would they're have to, to be IT a consumer say, who want, yeah, wishes exactly. the BI business intelligence group say would do that. Well, the experiment worked last time. Let's see if we can get an audience question. It has to be super short and Someone either loud enough or close enough. And anyone have a question? One over here. Yeah. I don't need a data engineer. I don't need an analyst. Ooh, that's interesting. And the person you sell it to is the data engineer you're about to fire. No, I think you are going to need data engineers for many years to come. The, the goal, though, is they're overwhelmed. And they're, not, they're putting out the next fire every day instead of thinking about the bigger problems and being more sort of strategic. And so this is about solving for the request that the data consumers could fulfill themselves and solving for acceleration of data and transformations of data in a way that is much more scalable, easier to manage, and easier to govern. So there's still lots of work for them to do. Like, I think of ETL as you kind of have the long-haul ETL and the last-mile ETL. And Dremio is going to really help with the last-mile ETL, but you probably still have a big chunk of long-haul ETL that you need your data engineers to focus on. You know, it's funny, because when I think about questions like this, you know, who you're going to put out of work, there's certain jobs, like in the sandwich store, if you really replace the sandwich maker, like, the, 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 you're cutting down on jobs. It feels to me like in terms of the digital transformation data revolution that's going on, I don't hear very many people going, oh, well, I just got too many data engineers and they're sitting around idle. That's not, kind of, people are like, I can't find this skill, I'm trying, to, you know what I mean? And so it feels to me like we're at the point where if you can accelerate this stuff, it, it, it's all good, you know, yeah. for now. 10 years from now, who knows? But it feels to me like you're probably finding people that are just like desperate to get more done because they're busy. Yeah, you're still going to have your, your Tableau users who are asking the interesting questions 
and telling the stories with the data. This is about helping them be more independent and self-sufficient. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have, uh, what's up with the hat? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this is uh, gnarly, spelled with a G. This is a narwhal. This is our company's logo, and it's the only real unicorn. So that's what that's all about. <laughs> oh, you want to be a real unicorn? <laughs> Duh. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Say thanks, folks. It is time to welcome our final contestant to the stage. Give a hand to, hey! There you go. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Mario Ciabarra. I'm the founder and CEO of Quantum Metric. I often ask, have you ever been to a website, try to transact, purchase something, and the website doesn't work for you? And think about what do you do when that happens. I want to come back to that, but I want to share what that looks like from the other side, from, from, uh, from the side of the CIO. What's it like to be the CIO when, when things don't go well? Well, when things are great, what I hear is it looks like this, best friends forever. When things aren't going well, when people are having that bad experience on the site, it feels a bit like this in the boardroom. <laughs> it, hurts, it hurts a little bit. How do we fix this? And uh, I don't know if I, if I saw Tyler this morning, but uh, it might come as a shock, but Tyler's right. The pace of change is accelerating. How, how do we stay ahead? How do we address these experiences? How do we deliver the best? It, I know there's some folks in the audience that compete directly with Amazon, but if you think that you're not competing with Amazon, I think we're all crazy. They're setting the bar so high on digital experiences. We have to deliver our best, and it has to be 24-7. And it has to be 24-7 while things are changing constantly. And we have to push for better innovation. How do we stay ahead of that? Quantum metric, if you can think about when you, when you had that bad experience, what did you do? Quantum metric looks at your behavior. It looks at, for example, I click the add to cart button and it doesn't work. Guess what I do? I click it five more times, what we call rage clicking. It's a real thing. I, 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 I might then click reload in my browser, and if you think about it, when would you ever click reload in the browser? It's when things aren't going so well. Maybe the back button. We look at two dozen different indicators that say, I'm not having a good time. We then take the, that behavior analytics and we push that into some predictive analytics to tell us what's the impact of this issue? How much is it costing our business? Is this something that we should wake everybody up? Or should, is, this not, is this a small issue? So when we have the CEO or or the board member that has a bad experience and they're calling us that, that hey, what, what's going on? How do we empower our organizations with understanding this is a big problem or this is a small one? And once we have that understanding, we can combine this with pixel perfect replay. We can see each user on your digital presence as if we were standing behind them. And an and end to end journey, whether it's mobile, desktop, web, or native apps. So we're in Vegas, here's table stakes. We have to do AI anomaly detection, business KPIs reporting, alerting, all the fun things that we expect out of a large enterprise platform. But this isn't what makes us special. What's amazing about the quantum metric platform is that it takes all of this data, all of these behavior analytics, and it uses Google BigQuery, a petabyte scale database that analyzes all of this information in seconds to tell us where our customers are struggling and what is the impact to our business in a quantifiable way showing us where drop-off occurs. And all of this is deployed in, in a few seconds, in just a couple lines of JavaScript. And I know many of us have heard that, sure, it's that easy, but it really is. So part of experience is performance, and slow is the new down. How do we, how, how do we adjust with this? How do we get buy-in from our team? By taking these performance metrics and putting them in perspective of how much money performance is costing us. Then we get buy-in from everyone, uh, understanding how fast is fast enough. Many of us went through this transition 10 years ago. Hey, we need APM tools. We need to understand where our challenges are from an app, network, or database perspective. Fast forward 10 years, we're no longer just focused in IT. IT needs to sit at the table and understand where are the challenges within our organization, within marketing, IT, and product. And we walk the walk, our audience, our buyers are our product isn't just IT, 
it's marketing and product because it brings all three major parts of this organization together aligned with, hey, here are our real challenges. Here's how, what we need to fix. So how do we get to the, to the table? How, how do we get IT to not be a cost center? In the words of Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Right? We, we need to understand exactly how we can help our business. And by understanding where folks are getting frustrated, we can drive that, that value. And QM has done this. We've, we've helped drive hundreds of millions of dollars of recovery of revenue where customers are frustrated and folks just don't have visibility into what, where it's happening. These are some of the amazing brands that are driving innovation on digital experiences. And we have the honor to work with them. And, and, and uh, it's been really, really an exciting journey for us. I'll leave you with uh, some content that we produced specifically for this audience. I hope you enjoy it. And, well. This is a slick presenter. He went right to the edge of his time and then started the drumming music and I couldn't stop. <laughs> I, I thought, I thought that, does that work in customer meetings? It's like, oh, they're getting up. We're ah. out of time, but I've got a video and <laughs> we'll enjoy that. Any questions? So I, I didn't, I, a great presentation. Looking at it from the business side, I get it. We're looking at revenue, we're looking at dollars, but I, I saw a huge, uh, something you didn't point out. The pixel perfect replay, how it can tie into customer service, how it can tie into operations for, for detecting issues in the field. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, thank you, Dino. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we, you know, there's top level revenue that we can affect. Let's let's drive more revenue for our business, but there's expenses that we have when we deliver bad experiences. People pick up phone calls, uh, or pick up the phone and make phone calls, and they, they have a, a very uh, expensive cost to them. And so by delivering better experiences, we can reduce the inbounds that people are getting that are challenged. And of course, there's, there's so much more that it's tough to measure, like just brand value of, of helping uh, people have incredible customer experiences on digital. One, one question I had is, uh, again, I did a little bit of research, but I, I may have captured this on, on, the, on the video. Uh, you talk a lot about browsers and the experience on browsers. Most of the e-commerce is moving to mobile devices. Are, and what happens when it's not an HTML-based uh, experience, it's in native apps? How do you plug yourself in there? Yeah, no, great question. So the question is, uh, how do we go end-to-end? -end? And that's absolutely what we do. We, we do both web and native apps and tie in that visibility across those platforms so we can see someone that's on their desktop at work, they're uh, on their ho way home on a train, they're on their mobile, uh, and then they, maybe they open up the app because their loyalty program is already, they're already signed in on their app and then they, go, they do that conversion. We can see folks transitioning across those platforms. It's not magic, uh, they have to be logged in to be able to tie that together, but we have a, a native SDK, which is a, a, a very simple implementation, a single line of code, and then on, on the web, it's just a couple lines of JavaScript. But yeah, absolutely tie that whole experience together. I have a question for all three of you. So. This app feels like it could cross so many business boundaries mm -hmm. that if you two were to look at this, you would end up maybe talking to the VP of marketing yes. or, depending on the use case, talking to whoever runs customer support organization. And I'm just, I mean, on the one hand, it's so cool it could do so many things. And on the other hand, it just sounds almost like a nightmare to get started because I got to get like, how do I even get, how, how, how would you think about getting started and how do you see customers sort of break through this conundrum of like, oh, everyone on the executive staff needs to get involved. We, we've had those, I'll, I'll start and, and if you like, but uh, we, we've had those experiences where, wow, we've gotten the CMO, the CIO, um, 
you know, folks in the call center, all involved, and it, and it feels like a difficult, long process. Um, one I of the, can't speed things up. Yeah, right, it's hard, it's, it's hard, it's the latest. And so we've been uh, very successful at replacing Tea Leaf, if you're familiar with that product in that space. Um, so that's a great place for us to start, but oftentimes the, the product folks, the marketing folks get involved, um, but you know, I'd love to hear your opinions. Well, I, we, we are a product company, so we have software uh, you know, that we offer and we have a pretty large uh, user experience team that just builds the experience into our products. I would get you straight in front of, of them because right now they're using Usabilla and other, and just to get a glimpse of what's happening on the other side. So if you've got Pipes, web or right. app products, the team responsible Probably. for delivering that product, like that yeah, team right there would managers, be a great product target Product would love yeah, to know that makes sense. what is being used. One question that came up in my mind, again, trying to understand how you're doing what you're doing, uh, is there any issue here with privacy? So I am a shopper, I just logged in, now I'm in my private domain. You're watching what I'm doing when I'm typing in my credit card, when I'm typing in where to ship. What are you doing with that? Great, great what question. happens in the web doesn't stay in the web, <laughs> unlike Vegas. So we, uh, we run in Google Cloud, and it's really important that we address GDPR, privacy, which is a big, you know, it's a big law, it's a fancy word for privacy and security in my mind. Uh, we encrypt all the data with a key that only our clients have. It's an RSA 2048 key, so only our clients can see what they want to capture. But PCI data, we don't want to capture at all. So we mask it at the device, never sent to our cloud and then stripped. Uh, and then we keep that data uh, private by ensuring that our design is privacy by default and privacy uh, you know, by design so that when you go and watch a replay, you don't need to know who this is unless you do. So if this person's committing fraud, we audit your use of that decryption key. So, hey, I want to see who this is. Why? Because it's fraud. And then I will see who that user was. I can see the things that they typed. But generally speaking, I don't need to see what was typed to help out on a digital experience. Okay. And then uh, in terms of speed, as, as you're collecting the data, um, how fast can I get the data in? If, say I'm launching, yep. I'm trying to play the launch, uh, let's say do East Coast first yep. and wait. Real, real time, so using Google BigQuery, uh, it's about five seconds behind. You can do co-browsing, which sort of ties into Dino's question in the call center. We can actually see a user, you know, about five seconds delayed. All the analytics are also about five seconds delayed. So very fast, uh, you know, using uh, you know, petabyte scale database is a lot of fun if you haven't tried it. How flexible is your SDK for like event creation to add key events to, that are specific to my use cases? Good, good question. Uh, yeah, everything is done in our UI. You don't have to configure events through your code, through a release, uh, through a, an iPhone release, which is more, more difficult, or even a web update. Everything's done in our UI, so you can configure, configure all that eventing within our UI. Do you find things are different? So I'm hearing I'm shipping a product that's a web or app. It, it, do you find that feeling different from if you're interfacing with someone that's entirely marketing, selling, you know, shoes or Coke or, is, is it basically the same or is there something different about it? I, I think everyone has reasons why people are coming to their site to, to grab content, to purchase something, to interact. There's, there's, a, there's a funnel. Uh, it might not look like a shopping cart funnel, but there's a reason and a goal that we have, you know, maybe the cheese at the end of the, of the maze. And so from that perspective, everyone's the same. We want to make sure that they're getting to the goals that we are providing this website, this digital experience. Um, but, you know, content providers, uh, financials, you know, e-commerce, they all have their different flavors, uh, you know, in terms of dashboarding, what content they want, they want to get from us. So they're all unique, but they all have that same funnel. Same general share, funnel. yeah. Um, we've done this experiment twice now. Anybody in the audience have a question? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, repeat the question. Yeah, so, so how, do, how do we integrate with, uh, with back end you know, systems and provide s some visibility into the experience and, and also integration with, with um, some of the other tools out there. Kind of, um, maybe just kind of sum that up in that question. So, yeah, absolutely. So back, back office, this is a great, uh, great use case. Like, uh, you know, for example, we've trained call agents. Are they using some of the new features that we have in our product? This is some of the use cases that we've experienced with some of our customers. You know, are, are we, um, 
you know, uh, and if they don't, if they're not using the, the new features, maybe they need some retraining because the whole idea of those features is to make them more efficient. And as far as integrating, um, you know, we can make our BigQuery data available in real time. So some of our customers use that for fraud monitoring. Uh, other customers will um, integrate with voice of customer with, uh, you know, with App Dynamics or New Relic or Dynatrace to understand, you know, yeah, great, I understand the experience is bad, but we know what's in the application, where inside the application. So we do, do, that, we do that handoff tor towards the APM from that perspective. Any final questions? Cost. Cost. So our cost is based on the amount of sessions, the amount of traffic that you have. Uh, I would put it, um, it's, it's kind of a market, um, we're, we're, in the, we're in the market range, so it's based off of just the, the, the traffic that you do. So it's based on transactions? Or? Yeah, yeah, the amount, amount of sessions, the amount of users you have on your site. Not page hits or anything? That's sort of uh, together. So page hits and sessions sort of map yeah. together, but yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Three interesting startups. I, I find it fun that the day started with a discussion of innovation. We got into the day after tomorrow. How does innovation happen? In my opinion, one of the key ways is through startups and even just hanging out with them sometimes, whether or not you end up using their stuff. Of course, they, they prefer that you would, but it can just get you thinking differently about stuff. So I personally really enjoy having a chance to hear from the startups. Thanks to you two for asking the questions. And uh, at this point, I'd like to bring Todd back out on stage to close out the morning session.